What's up everyone, it's remake time once again, and today we're revisiting Pokemon's very own Iron Man, Scizor. Scizor intimidated us with his villainous role in the fourth Pokemon movie under the ownership of the Iron Mask Marauder, viciously hunting Celebi. And yeah, I don't want this intro to be that long, I'm sure you've already seen the length of this video, so let's get right into it. Today we'll be examining how well this menacing metal insect fared in the competitive scene. So how great was Scizor actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Scizor started his competitive career in the second generation as a baton passer that powered up its teammates by sending them swords dances and agilities. When passed to threats like Marowak and Machamp, games could potentially end really fast. Unlike other popular baton passers like Smeargle and Jolteon, it scared out Executor with the threat of a clean one-hit KO from its quadruple effective stab hidden power bug. Its normal resistance was also key as it could set up safely against the king of GSC, Snorlax. Scizor's main issue though was was that of getting phased by the two most common phasers, Whirlwind Skarmory on defensive teams and Roar Steelix on offensive teams. So how did it function if those two were likely to make an appearance in any given games? Well luckily Scizor wasn't the only Pokemon that those two got used to counter. They were also used to check the Snorlaxes on Scizor's team. Snorlax could force Skarmory to rest and could cripple Steelix with Lovely Kiss, Body Slam Paralysis, or heavy damage from Earthquake or Fire Blast. And from there Scizor could pass in peace. Plus, against offensive teams that relied on Tyranitar as their phaser, Scizor was immediately threatening as Tyranitar wanted nothing to do with it. Unfortunately, Scizor was purely relegated to Baton Pass teams, as the presence of Pokemon like Zapdos, Gengar, and even Sleeping Skarmory made it too difficult for it to sweep on its own. However, without Scizor, Baton Pass teams don't work at all, and as such, it has a legitimate, important role, even though it's small, in the GSC metagame. Scizor was once again relegated to full Baton Pass teams in advance, although this time it wasn't as much of a staple as it was before. It was mostly outclassed by Mawile of all things, who resisted rock and flying, had Intimidate to soften blows, and even packed Taunt to prevent Skarmory from phasing it. Scizor's earthquake neutrality and access to agility were useful, but Mawile was more consistent given how terrifying choice ban rock slides and hidden power flyings from Tyranitar and Salamence were. Outside Baton Pass chains, Scizor wasn't anything too special, as it was mostly outclassed by Heracross. The one advantage Scizor had was its immunity to Sandstorm. This allowed it to potentially run an Endure plus Reversal, allowing it to Swords Dance safely, then survive any attack in order to gain a speed boost from Selectberry and jack its Reversal's power up to its max of 200 in one fell swoop, with its Swarm ability adding fuel to the fire by boosting its Stab Hidden Power bug. Scizor was potentially scary, but had several severe issues. Scizor lacked coverage against flying types and couldn't even outspeed Aerodactyl after eating its Select Berry. While Scizor was sadly not good enough to be OU, it was definitely far too powerful for UU, and thus it languishes in Gen 3's borderline. In Gen 4, Scizor still wasn't anything special in Diamond and Pearl. But once Platinum came around, Scizor instantly skyrocketed to being easily the most used Pokemon in OU. The question, why? The answer, Bullet Punch. With its new Technician ability, this new stab priority attack jumped to an effective 90 base power, which was stronger than the previous standard in Extreme Speed, and was incredibly good for revenge killing purposes with Choice Ban. Scizor also has stab on another incredible Choice Ban friendly move, U-Turn. Suddenly the entire metagame seemed to be banded Scizor, firing off U-Turns all game long, until it was time to revenge kill the incredibly dangerous Salamence with Bullet Punch. And as if it didn't have enough going for it already, it also had access to a technician boosted pursuit, allowing it to use its steel typing to resist the OU newcomer Latias and its Draco Meteor, and KO Latias as it attempted to switch out. Any given OU game had ridiculously high chance of at least one player using Bandit Scizor, and it wasn't exactly a surprise for both players to be using it either. Scizor shaped the metagame around it, with sets like Protect and Hidden Power Fire Gengar popping up, which was used to scout whether it was going to be Bullet Punch or Pursuit, or Bait Scizor into Bullet Punch so Magnezone could pick it off and then something like Salamence could abuse its absence. And look, it's simply impossible to overstate how common and important Scizor was. Scizor's U-turn was such an automatic move that it wasn't even uncommon for Blissey to stay in and soft boil the damage off, even when Scizor threatened to one-hit KO it with Superpower. And speaking of which, Superpower was another one of Platinum's gifts, as now Scizor had a terrific fighting move that utterly destroyed Kaki Heatran and could even smash Skarmory a 
attempting to roost, as Skarmory would lose its flying type, becoming pure steel and thus weak to fighting. Scizor was absolutely everywhere, and while it just about always used Band, it eventually took a leaf out of the new popular's Choice Scarf Tyranitar's book and began running Scarf itself. This allowed it to more safely check Latias, even when it was at low health, and it completely dominated Gengar and Starmory too. Scizor also checked all variants of Swords Dance Lucario, unlike Scarf Tyranitar, who fell to Bullet Punch. Scarf Scizor even was a fairly decent lead, as it completely shredded the new Azelf variants, which were Choice Ban and Culberberry, that eschewed Focus Sash in favor of beating Machamp. And then, Latias was banned, and one of Scizor's main targets disappeared. Now, it was still needed for the ever-dangerous Salamence, but then a few months later, Salamence itself was banned. The metagame shifted, and suddenly it wasn't in Scizor's favor. Not only were the top Pokemon in the metagame it was so good at dealing with were gone, but its nemesis Heatran was now the new number one in town. Plus, other threats like Infernape, Breloom, Zapdos, and Kingdra were rising, and Scizor wasn't as reliable at revenge killing the Salamence replacing Dragonite, thanks to Dragonite's higher physical bulk. Scizor didn't exactly disappear, but it became noticeably less common. Scarf sets were still quite solid, especially as Subsplit Gengar was considered nigh uncounterable, and Scarf Pursuit, without being weak to Focus Blast like Tyranitar, meant Scizor was one of the best checks to Gengar. But eventually, Scizor came roaring back with a new set, Bulky Swords Dance with Roost, with the excellent Heart Gold and Soul Silver edition of Bug Bite as its Bug Stab, which also got a Technician Boost. Turns out, a lot of Scizor's checks, like Vaporeon, Wish Combine Jirachi, and Heat Wave Less Zapdos, that is to say, a lot of them, considering how popular Substitute Toxic variants were, relied on Choice Band sets getting worn down on their own. Since Scizor willingly switched a lot, as its main attack was U-Turn, and thus couldn't heal off Stealth Rock. But with Leftovers and Roost, Scizor had incredible longevity that allowed it to stick around throughout a game, waiting for checks like Infernape to get worn down, and eventually cornering the opponent for a sweep. It was incredibly hard to maneuver if one's team was unprepared, and many teams were. Plus, even prepared teams could have their checks bypassed, as Heatran could easily be lured in and worn down by Pokemon such as Zapdos and Jirachi. This Scizor set was even good at 1v1-ing usually reliable checks in Gyarados and Suicune, and its heavy special defense investment even allowed it to survive almost all the hidden power fires in OU. Plus, Scizor's newfound resilience allowed it to reliably use its bulk to check dangerous threats to most offense teams such as Scarf Flygon, Agility Metagross, Trick Room Bronzong, Dragon Dance Kingdra, and even Subsplit Gengar. Bulky Swords Dance Scizor became one of late DPP's most dangerous sweepers, and for Scizor as a whole, it was a great finish for its breakout generation. And as if it wasn't enough, Scizor was even great in the tier above OU. Turns out Ubers has a lot of Dragon types spamming their Dragon type moves with the only resist being steel types, and the only uber steel type is Dialga, who is also half dragon, and thus doesn't pack a resist. So ubers tends to dip into OU for its steel types, and Scizor is one of them. It of course packed its ever useful bullet punch for revenge killing many Pokemon, most notably Deoxys Attack, Weaken Rayquaza, Darkrai, Mewtwo, and Laddie Twins, but also potentially Shaman Sky, Giratina Origin, and even Rock Polish Groudon. Its stab U-turn threatened the many Pokemon weak to it at full health, while allowing one of its scary teammates to switch in safely. Scizor's pursuit was also useful for catching the tier's many psychic types attempting to flee from U-turn. It made for a nasty pairing with Wobbuffet, whose Encore and Tickle allowed Scizor to successfully pursuit trap even the incredibly bulky Lugia. Scizor was even quite a good lead, as it limited the metagame defining Deoxys speed leads to one hazard, bringing them down to the sash and then finishing them off with Bullet Punch, while also matching up well against Deoxys Attack, Frostlast, and even Dark Cry, thanks to Lumberry. The main difference between Uber Scizor and its OU counterpart was that it required a lot more special defense investment in Ubers, even on choice band sets, although it was also excellent with leftovers and roost. Overall, Scizor was an incredibly important, defining member of the Ubers metagame as well. Scizor's title as Pokemon's premier gunslinger translated fairly well to doubles, where it was able to put its technician bullet punches to good use, picking off low HP enemies and enabling functional 1v1s. However, unlike in singles, Scizor was able to make good use of its more neglected type in doubles. While Bug still isn't going to topple the strongest types anytime soon, Scizor's access to a technician boosted Bug Bite is incredible when facing off against the berries that litter doubles. And perhaps more importantly, it absolutely annihilates the queen of VGC 
Percy, Cresselia. Scizor also gets to use Akaberry to shore up its own proclivity to getting torched, and it brings an interesting move in Faint to the table, letting its teammates forget their worries about Protect and enjoy the bliss of attacking without regrets. As such, Scizor saw VGC play from the very early days of standardized doubles tournaments, where it thrived on rain teams alongside Ludicolo to patch up its one crippling weakness. Scizor etched its names in the ancient tables of VGC in 2009, where Steven Wasserloos, known as Neo Cyrex on Smogan, used it on a rain team to place third at Worlds. However, without much opportunity to set up, Scizor's offensive power is only notable if it can hit something that doesn't resist it. And while Bullet Punch and Bug Bite are incredible moves in their own right, the offensive typing isn't exactly top of the litter. Scizor sadly wasn't able to break through 2010's legendary defenses, especially with enemies such as Groudon and Ho-Oh being as common as they are. And let's not forget Kyogre. Scizor struggles in general against bulky water types, and the Lord of the Ocean certainly wasn't an exception. Scizor started Generation 5 right where it left off in the 4th, a top tier OU. Early in black and white, a specially defensive Swords Dance set holding Lumberry emerged to handle Darkrai, which had been let loose in OU. Eventually, Darkrai was banned, Scizor exchanged Lumberry for leftovers, and boom, it was already defining the tier with this set. It made for an excellent, iconic pairing with Swords Dance Gliscor, who had similar defensive utility turned sweep potential, and even helped Scizor out by baiting in and shutting down Skarmory with Taunt. Scizor was of course as important defensively as ever, keeping in check old threats like the Laddie Twins while also combating new terrors such as the incredibly scary Terrakion and Reuniclus. Eventually, its old choice band set returned and did the exact same things as it did before, including becoming the most used Pokemon in the metagame. The newest thing about it was its pairing with Rotom Wash, who in addition to shedding its partial ghost type for water, had also gained the U-turn clone move Volt Switch in the 5th generation. The two were able to force out each other's switch-ins with ease, chaining Volt Switch and U-Turn together, constantly forcing the opponent out, chipping them and keeping offensive momentum, in a fierce combination known as Volt Turn, that had the best players in the metagame scratching their heads as to how to beat it. It was so ridiculously obnoxious that a few even wanted it banned or limited in some way. The two were everywhere, and so it remained until Black and White 2, when Garchomp was re-released into OU in the wake of the Sandvale ban, and Garchomp having gained its Dream World ability Rough Skin. With a Rocky Helmet attached, Garchomp made contact moves such as Scizor's U-Turn seriously sting with recoil, and it could even block Rotom's Volt Switch without being weak to a potential Hydro Pump, so the combination took a severe hit. However, Scizor had more tricks up its sleeve. With its Swords Dance Flying Gem Acrobatic set, it lured in its common counters, most notably Jellicent on Sand and Tenacruel on Rain, and obliterated them. This was incredible support for the dangerous new Keldeo, who found itself stuffed by both. Acrozor, as it was referred to, came to be one of the defining faces of offense for quite a while, as it was difficult to counter safely and fulfilled its intended purpose reliably. However, Scizor eventually hit a wall, almost literally. Dedicated Spikes teams with Magic Guard psychic types became incredibly popular, and Scizor was unable to deal with them, getting almost permanently walled by Skarmory and worn down with ease by all the residual damage from Hazards and Rocky Helmet in addition to chip damage, even with Roost. This made it unable to pose a successful offensive threat and unreliable at fulfilling a defensive role. And as such, Scizor lost its high ranking place in the metagame. To succeed with Scizor after the proliferation of those teams took over the tier took a lot of maintenance and skill. That said, it still had some moments, especially with Choice Scarf, who unlike Scarf Tyranitar, outran the dangerous Alakazam and wasn't weak to its Focus Blast. It also threatened several teams with Swords Dance when Ferrothorn became more popular than Skarmory due to being better against Rain, and Scizor's pursuit was invaluable on Rain teams that wanted to be more secure against the incredibly dangerous Latios. It was just no longer the incredibly splashable, dominant Pokemon it had previously been. However, Scizor's worst was still a whole lot better than most other Pokemon's best, and as such, it remained a legitimate OU Pokemon. Once Gen 5 rolled around, Scizor was able to more firmly establish itself as a top VGC threat. 2012's metagame included both Scizor and the biggest reason to use Scizor. Cresselia, of course. If you were looking for a one-stop shop on how to eliminate Cresselia, Scizor was certainly the premier option, since Bugbite would chunk Cresselia and give Scizor a tasty berry snack if the Cresselia had something tucked away for later. Early Scizor sets were basically what you'd expect, focusing on bulk and power to better boost Bullet Punch and Bugbite. Gen 5 also introduced 
introduced the gem items, which could give Scizor a one-time extremely powerful attack via flying gem acrobatics, which did neutral damage to most of Scizor's checks. One notable user of flying gem Scizor was Manoj Mangosol Sunny, who took 4th at Madison Regionals and 3rd at Nationals with the acrobatic bug. And if you didn't run that, early Scizor sets focused on Akaberry for obvious reasons. One other interesting Scizor strategy involved a different berry, Lumberry. While Prankster Thunderous was most notorious for disrupting the enemy team with its mix of paralysis and confusion, Swagger could be applied just as destructively to a Lumberried teammate, giving Scizor the effective Swords Dance it wanted without wasting a turn. However, some players thought that with intelligent play, Swords Dance might not be so improbable after all, and they ended up breaking the metagame wide open. And you might know their names, Wolf Glick and Aaron Zhang. As the story goes, Aaron had been using a modified version of Korean national champion Won Suk Jang's team, which he loved save for one Pokemon, Ferrothorn, which he thought was too defensive. In the midst of their practice, Wolf suggested to Aaron that he replace Ferrothorn with an unusual Scizor variant, Swords Dance Scizor, a complete novelty to the metagame. However, that novelty ended up being monstrously powerful. Aaron's strategy was to bring in Scizor against some of the many Pokemon that can't check Scizor easily and Swords Dance. Of course, that strategy might seem too simple, and it is, but if you bring in a Scizor counter who can handle a plus two bullet punch, no big deal, right? That's where this set's hidden X factor comes into play. It's another gem, but not the common flying gem. Instead, Aaron and Wolf went all in on Scizor still typing, giving it a steel gem to upgrade bullet punch from a rifle to a bonafide bazooka. With steel gem backing it, a plus two Scizor was capable of one hit killing some of the metagame's most common Pokemon, such as Garchomp and Latios. Once those threats are removed, Scizor takes a chomp out of every other Pokemon with its stab bug bite, frequently healing itself in the process. Aaron also devised an HP spread that let his Scizor function well next to his Garchomp. With the bulk he invested, Scizor always lived two earthquakes from its teammate, letting him launch an all-out assault without worrying about collateral damage. Both Aaron and Wolf ended up winning US Nationals with their sneak attack scissor, with Aaron being in seniors and Wolf in masters, and they changed the shape of the 2012 metagame in the process. Aaron's team of Garchomp, Hitmontop, Tyranitar, Thunderous, Scizor, and Cresselia ended up being quite ubiquitous, with Aaron's brother Brendan Babitron Zhang using a variant to place third in the juniors division of Worlds, and Cameron Jahadi finishing fifth in seniors. While both Aaron and Wolf opted for a different team for their Worlds campaigners, the puke green scissor that took Nationals by Storm became Aaron's calling card, a signature masterstroke of one of Senior's most lauded players on his way to becoming one of the faces of the Masters division. Aaron even said he regretted not using his Scizor team at Worlds, although looking back that may have been a wise choice. After Wolf and Aaron showed just what Scizor could do, many players opted to prepare for Scizor, and this most frequently took the form of turning Cresselia into a pseudo fire type by swapping one of its other moves such as Icy Wind for Hidden Power to ensure they could remove its biggest threat from the field with minimum distress. Nevertheless, several versions of Scizor showed up at Worlds and performed well, though Swords Dance was nowhere to be seen. Mangle Soul used the same team he had relied on all season to turn in a respectable 11th place finish. Scott Glaza of Nugget Bridge also used Acrobatics to place 10th, though he made an interesting swap to Lumberry to tank status moves. Huey Ha went back to the standard Akaberry Scizor with Feint, which enabled his team's Blizzard spam nicely and guided him to 9th place. In top cut, Spaniard Guillermo Castilla Diaz took 7th place, while Matt Cole Coil took 6. Guillermo ran his scissor alongside an unexpected Swampert, while Matt had it on a rain team and used it to bait fire moves into Chandelure, notably becoming the only top 8 player in 2012 to forego Cresselia. Incidentally enough, legendary trainer Ray Rizzo completed his 3 peat in 2012, but said afterwards that the Pokemon he was most scared of was Scizor. Luckily for Ray, he didn't face a single Scizor in the entire tournament, maybe because of the unexpected amount of Hidden Power Fire, Rotom Heat, and Zapdos that existed almost purely to cook the bugs in its shell. While Scizor didn't have an especially auspicious end to 2012, it was still one of the meta's most defining Pokemon. That prevalence only escalated in 2013, where the knowledge of Cybertron Scizor became widespread. In fact, some of Scizor's most devoted users couldn't let go of it. In the early days of 2013, Cybertron's Scizor team re-emerged to wreak havoc again, with its old acolytes piloting it to success once again. Brendan Zhang won the Philadelphia Regional 
finals in juniors, and both Aaron and Cameron used it for their Masters debut, with Cameron winning San Jose Regionals Masters and Aaron finishing second at the Philadelphia Regionals, where Edward Fan also used the team to finish top four. In fact, Scissor also ended up winning Philadelphia Regionals, although it wasn't Swords Dance. Instead, longtime Pokemon and Melee player Matt BearsFan092, Sibilden, decided to throw it back to the past and run Acrobatics Flying Gem Scizor to effectively remove the fighting types that threatened his substitute centric team. While Scizor's first big win in 2013 was without Swords Dance, the Cybertron Scizor was by far the most dominant version throughout the season. And although Landorus's Intimidate and Thunderous's Typing gave Scizor problems, Scizor showed up frequently throughout the 2013 season as a powerful Steel type and Cresselia answer. Some of its best placements include Leonard the Wobblefett Craft's ninth place at the St. Louis Regionals with Tailwind Aka Scizor, plus Hugh Ronzani's second place and Rob Whitehill's eighth at the Australian Nationals, alongside a mysterious seventh placer whose name is lost to history. Over in Europe, brothers Matteo and Alberto Gini developed a rain centric Scizor team, including Politoed, Thunderous, Hydreigon, Kingdra, and Breloom, along with their Cybertron Source Dance Scizors to establish dominance. Matteo won in Milan, while Alberto placed top 16, then Alberto got his win in Bohum, while Matteo placed top 8. Quite a few other Europeans also used Scizor to great effect. At the Birmingham Regionals, Rachel Anand made top 8, while Huey Buizen, Thomas R, and Christopher Arthur made top 16. Christopher also placed top 16 in Milan, and Italian Luigi Lo Giudice made top 3 in Bohum. Meanwhile, over in the United States, Aaron brought his trusty Swords Dance Scizor to Nationals once again, albeit this time with its normal red coat of paint. While Aaron wasn't able to repeat his prior success, he was still the best placing Scizor player at the event, placing 13th ahead of 16th placer Kevin Fisher, who also used Source Dance Scizor along with Chandelure, Zach Jens who finished 18th, and 30th place finisher John Olaf Magnuson. As such, Scizor once again had quite a few players touting it going into world season, and many of these players managed to use it to successfully make day 2. Hugh Ronzani finished 46, Christopher Arthur made 42nd, Rachel Anand ended at 36, the Genie brothers finished in the top 35, with Alberto at 34th and Matteo at 31st, and Luigi took Scizor all the way to top 8, where he finished 7th using a modified version of the Cybertron team that swapped Hitmontop for a Super Intimidator in Landorus Thurian. Two new players also took Scizor to good results at Worlds, with Ben Rotham finished 17th, and Barry Baz Anderson modified his nefarious Lipard Breloom team, which triple top cut European regionals by dropping Volcarona for, what else, Source Dance Steel Gem Scizor, finishing 9th at Worlds. While the Masters weren't able to bring Scizor to quite the same level of success at Worlds that it saw throughout the year, senior world champion Hayden McTavish used Swords Dance Aka Scizor in his winning run, capping off a banner year for the bug. Generation 6 came around, many Pokemon got Mega Evolutions, and not only did Scizor get one, it's got one of the best ones. Its previous highest stats, attack and defense, were jacked up. Its defense stat was equal to even Skarmory's now, and since it had more HP, it was in fact physically bulkier than Skarmory. It also got a significant boost for its previously unimpressive special defense and speed stats. As a result, it was now an incredibly well-rounded Pokemon that was able to effortlessly pose an offensive and defensive threat, making it more than worthy of a team's mega slot. As if it weren't enough, it could now use a significantly buffed knockoff that provided coverage and removed leftovers in one fell swoop. Its old nemesis, Heat Ran in particular, got worn down ridiculously quickly in conjunction with Stealth Rock, while Scizor stayed healthy with Roost long enough to be able to sweep late game. Knock was useful for removing Keldeo's choice specs as well. Mega Scizor could also go pure utility, making use of the buff Defog to support its team with hazard removal. However, it was able to punish teams that relied on it being slow. It could go pure offense just as easily with a fast three attack Swords Dance set that plowed through would-be checks in Rotom Wash and especially defensive Heat Ran. It made for a fierce combination with Bisharp as one of them would wear down Keldeo with a Swords Dance boosted attack so that the other could finish it off. This set also had a significant metagame impact and that it was so dangerous that it inspired even bulky Heat Ran sets to run max speed just so they could check it. When Aura 
Raz came around, Scizor's defensive use was more important than ever. It was arguably the only true counter to Mega Metagross, who was once considered for Ubers, as well as the terrifying Weavile, as Scizor's Mega Stone meant it wasn't affected by knockoff. This trick was similarly useful against Bisharp. It was also a good check to cure in black the increasingly popular Mega Alakazam, which was otherwise nearly impossible to safely handle without a Chansey, and unlike Chansey, it couldn't be tricked by choice Latios sets. Some players even ran dedicated Pursuit Scizor variants, recognizing how difficult it was to safely sweep with Source Dance and instead preferring the extra defensive utility. Getting rid of Laddy was especially useful for a teammate like Keldeo, and Scizor could even super effectively pursue Mega Metagross. Scizor's stab bullet punch was also key in staving off the metagame's defining threat, Calm Mind Clefable. Funnily enough, Scizor's newfound special bulk it received from its Mega Form was so impressive that it could even survive a Calm Mind boosted flamethrower from Clef, which is somewhat mind boggling given that neither its HP or special defense are that high, even when the 6th generation had nerfed the move's base power to 90. By extension, Scizor could survive Magnezone's Hidden Power Fire with ease, even with Stealth Rock in play. It could even do the same against the immensely powerful Mega Deancey, whom it then threatened to shatter with Bullet Punch. Eventually, Sticky Web teams became powerful metagame forces, and Scizor anchored them. It didn't have to worry about Heatran running enough speed EVs to outrun it when the web would slow it down anyway, and Scizor could finally comfortably run a fully offensive set with an adamant nature, which would outrun a slowed down Scarf Magnezone as well. Offensive Scizor with Sticky Web effortlessly cut through many a team and added another set to the extensive list of things Scizor could viably run. It was always present throughout the 6th generation, never at the absolute forefront of the metagame, but always an important part of it, being able to run a plethora of sets and being able to use them well. Finally, Mega Scizor had an important niche in Ubers, checking the unequivocally most dangerous Pokemon in the tier, Xerneas. It resisted its Moonblast, wasn't weak to its common coverage in Thunder and Hidden Power Ground, stayed healthy with Bruce, and most importantly, smacked it with its super effective stab priority, meaning that it didn't necessarily have to be in perfect condition to deal with it. Scizor's Pursuit was also excellent in opening up Primal Kyogre, since it trapped the Soul Dew Laddie Twins, and its ability to trap Mega Gengar was nothing to sneeze at either. Putting Primal Groudon, Mega Salamence, and most Arceus forms on a timer via Toxic extended its general usefulness significantly as well. It wasn't a glamorous role, and the Mega competition in Ubers was stiff, but the role was an important one, so Scizor always had a place in the metagame. The switch to X and Y came with many complicated repercussions for Scizor. On the positive side, the introduction of the new fairy type gave Scizor a new class of targets to bullet punch, and it was one of the lucky few Pokemon to be gifted with a Mega Evolution, with its particular Mega giving a huge boost to attack and defense, and a nice pump up to everything else except HP. Hidden Power was also nerfed to 60 base power from a potential 70, giving Scizor a bit of breathing room when it came to tech carried specifically to beat it. On the flip, Mega Scizor's boost weren't game-breaking enough to justify using it most of the time, and Scizor paid the price for its new toys by losing old ones. Gen 6 removed gems entirely, neutering Scizor's offensive power, and to add insult to injury, the lack of a bug bite move tutor meant Scizor had to use the far inferior X Scissor as its stab of choice. It doesn't end there either. 2014 had even more Intimidate in the meta than 2013, as even though Landorus was gone for the moment, Mega Mawile's near total dominance meant Intimidate was on every team. And if you didn't have Mawile, then Salamence, Mega Manetric, or Gyarados would fill that role. As Steel-type no longer resisted Dark, Scizor both had to contend with opposing Sucker Punches and face competition as a priority user from Bisharp and Mega Mawile. And finally, the addition of Fairy Typing, while a good sign on the surface, was actually a big problem for Scizor. While it's true that Steel is super effective against Fairy, if you actually look at the Fairy Types that were common in 2014, such as Azumarill and Mega Mawile, yeah, they don't care about Steel Typing at all. In fact, what Fairy functionally did was bring a one-time nearly useless typing into prevalence, and it wasn't one Scizor wanted to see. That's right, fire types were here to stay, especially the demonic Talonflame and the absurdly powerful Mega Charizard Y, Scizor's worst nightmares. And with fire types comes burns, which is Scizor's other downfall. All that put together made for a much more unwelcoming metagame for Scizor and its bullet punches. Its one saving grace was those punches, which still did fairly well in, well, punching holes through a 
a fairly frail metagame if Scizor wasn't intimidated, especially the odd Gardevoirs. If running a Swords Dance set, Lumberry was nearly mandatory. Scizor still saw some scattered success in the early days of the format, though it was a far cry from its past power. Matt Coyle brought it back from 2012 to finish 14th at the Virginia Regionals. At Winter Regionals, it actually had quite a few good placements. In Salem, Alex Evan Falco Ogosla finished second, and Tony Chinese Dude Chian finished third with Choice Band Scizor. Jonathan Mendoza placed 11th at Long Beach Regionals, while Andy Garcia claimed 21st, and Michael Shaw ended at 10th in Orlando. Branded Akin Tokyo also won the Nintendo UK Winter event with Source Dance Lum Scizor, but he didn't use it once. Sort of sums up for Scizor this season, huh? Nevertheless, some players still stuck by it into spring. Seattle became Scizor Central, Sean Webb finished 8th, and Tony Xiong and Randy R. Inanimate Qua made it an All Canada and All Choice Band Scizor Finals, with Randy's own Scizor having been inspired by Tony's in the first place, with an eclectic moveset of Bullet Punch, Faint, U Turn, and Protect. The spread, which Randy copied from Tony, was designed to live Talonflame Brave Bird and then just click Bullet Punch and do big damage, especially to something like Gardevoir, while Thief hits Aegislash, one of Scizor's biggest problems. Other than that, it was all power and speed, which is what you would expect from a Choice Band set. In the end, it was Tony who took it home, winning his second unofficial Canadian Championships. That wasn't Scizor's only spring victory, though. Ben Irons finished first at the Overland Park Kansas Regionals, where Aaron Grubbs also took fifth. In Athens, Georgia, Isaac Van Name took Scizor to 15th. Scizor also had a few international results, with Luke M finishing 14th in Brisbane, and Carlos Rendon adapting Randy and Tony's Choice Band Scizor to a Life Orb version to claim third out of 300 players at Mexico City's Premier Challenge. Life Orb freed Scizor up to use its other moves to good use, with U-Turn KOing High Dragon, Thief preventing Aegis Slash Substitute, and Fate able to pick off weakened Talon Flames, as well as Breaking Protect. In fact, Life Orb Scizor's versatility was so valuable that Randy switched to it for US Nationals while he placed 16th, only adjusting his spread slightly to outspeed Ludicolo out of rain and hit it hard with U-Turn. Come Worlds, most players had given up on Scizor, as only had two day two appearances, with Tiffany Stanley finishing 37th and Kelly Mercier White ending at 52nd, a far cry from its past two years of top eights. Patrick Donegan used it to place 11th at Philly Regionals, closing out the season, but Scizor's 2014 was dramatically less successful than it was used to. Luckily for Scizor, 2015 switch to Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire at least gave it one tool back in the form of Bug Bite. Although, of course, the gems were still gone forever. In fact, Scizor made a big splash early on in 2015 at the hands of none other than Baz Anderson, who used his same Lipard Breloom team from 2013 Worlds to win the Arnhem Regionals, but with an upgraded Swords Dance Mega Scizor, adding knockoff over Bug Bite to hit Aegislash. However, Scizor remained a niche, if somewhat effective, pick, as the problems that Gen 6 had introduced remained, and it was really only safe from the very prevalent burns with Lumberry as its item. Andrew Hovis placed 12th at the Missouri Winter Regionals, while William Bioski Hall took 2nd at the California Regionals, ahead of other Scizor users in 10th placer Eric Holmstrom and Dane Zyman. In Florida, William Collins finished 3rd, and in the Northwest, Josh Krieger and Gary Quien took home a pair of 10th places at Oregon and Washington, respectively, both using Lumberry. Josh Sperry also finished 7th at the Utah Regionals. Scizor also popped up in Europe, with Simon Paralili placing 5th at the Italian Regionals, while Alberto Gini revisited Scizor to take 6th. When Nationals rolled around, Adrian Bauman made top 8 in Germany, while Tursa Butafuoco finished 13th in the United Kingdom. Rachel Anan also reunited with Scizor to place 18th, while James Tarbuck finished 19th, and Baz delivered a less stellar performance by finishing 34th. At the US Nationals, Zach Dalton finished 19th in the Masters Division, while Ben Piercy won seniors, and by World Scizor repeated its old disappearing act, with Baz Anderson being its sole representative and finishing at 37th. Scizor rounded out its Gen 6 career with a pitiful few appearances in 2016. Just like in 2010, it matched up very poorly against both Kyogre and Groudon, severely limiting its use. However, those two weren't the only big dogs in the format anymore. Scizor had its uses as a very niche counter of 2016's undisputed ruler in Xerneas, who didn't appreciate bullet punches even after setting up Geomancy. However, Scizor's star was still fading, as 2016 also had plenty of Hitmontop and Mega Salamence, making its life incredibly hard. As such, this was still a very niche strategy and only had a few high-level placings, with Ricardo Apamea finishing 7th at the UK Nationals by pairing Scizor with Mega Gengar, while Dinesh Selva Kumar used it on a very unorthodox team in Sydney, featuring Mega Mewtwo Y, Swellow, and Crawdon to finish 6th. A 
Other Sizzler placements included Alexander Kunz, 11th at German Nationals, Estefan Valdebenedos, 5th at the Chile Regionals, and Blake Bopper Hopper's top 16th finish at Worlds. The seventh generation came around and Mega Scissor was an excellent Pokemon once again. Early on, it was notable as the one reliable check to Mega Metagross, but remained terrific even after Metagross was banned. It absolutely loved Tapu Bulu's grassy terrain, providing it the passive recovery it usually missed as a Mega. Its defensive abilities were incredibly key as it managed to stand up to even Z users. Notably, it was one of the few Pokemon that could reliably check Kartana. It was the only Pokemon in the game besides Avalog that safely prevented Kirin Black from getting an automatic KO, it was able to stand up to Tapabula's obscenely powerful choice band Woodhammer, and it was excellent at thwarting Zygarde while it was in the tier thanks to its newly gained curse. It also checked Mega Alakazam once again, handled the dangerous Mega Laddie Twins, and walled Mega Mawile, who was generally considered unwallable so long as it packed Fire Fang, which most Mawile did. Its defensive utility was so key that sweeping with it was generally an afterthought, especially given how utterly helpless it was against Toxapex besides knocking off its Black Sludge, but it could defensively pick off offensive teams who relied on Z-Move Heatran lacking recovery and the Frail Greninja to withstand its powerful bullet punch. However, many teams wanted the turn Scizor's bulk afforded it to result in more than just getting walled, and thus Scizor provided key defensive utility for many teams in the fog. Scizor was pretty much the same Pokemon as it was in Oras, Bulk, Swords Dance, Roost, and U-Turn, except this time it didn't go on the pure offensive because its defenses were just too important. It was an absolutely crucial Pokemon in the OU metagame Game once again, holding many teams together against the slew of absurdly strong threats. Regular Scizor was now tiered separately from its mega form, and it dropped to Yu Yu. There, it was absurdly good, blowing past many top threats such as Terrakion and Mega Altaria with its powerful bullet punch while checking the always dangerous Latias. Many top players felt Scizor should have been banned, as its U turn, especially in conjunction with Stealth Rock, was such a powerful weapon that it was basically required to have a strong punish to it, so it didn't just almost instantly destroy the other team and the options to do this were not only severely limited, they all had serious potential flaws. The most common was Rocky Helmet Amoongus, who could shrug off the hit thanks to Regenerator and trip Scizor in the process. The problem was that Scizor could easily Sword Stance on the switch, and with Bugnium Z blow past Amoongus with a brutally powerful Savage spinout that bypassed U-Turn's forced switch. Fire types with Rocky Helmet, and in Moltres's case, Flame Body, were more reliable against Scizor itself, but they had the huge issue of being crippled by Stealth Rock, and Rocky Helmet Cobalion had no way to heal itself. There were some creative ways used to beat Scizor, such as Eject Button preventing it from switching with U-Turn, allowing Magneton to switch in and trap it for free, but overall it was an incredibly oppressive Pokemon, even if one didn't consider it banworthy, and was absolutely one of, if not the biggest threats in the tier. Scizor had quite a rude awakening to 2017. While it certainly had more fairy types around with the Tapus, it actually had matched up very poorly against most of them. Both Tapu Fini and Tapu Koko didn't mind Bullet Punch and could hit back with their own special move. But just as in singles, Scizor's true worst enemy was Tapu Lele, who completely nullified Bullet Punch against any grounded opponents with its psychic terrain, severing Scizor from the tool that had defined it for three generations. And Tapu Bulu? Pfft, nobody ran bad. Add in the prevalence of Celesteela and Arcanine, and ah jeez Rick, it's hard to go on. Oh man, and its other good tool, Bug Bite, it lost that again too because there were no move tutors in Sun and Moon. Scizor just can't catch a break, huh? Scizor only saw one quite gimmicky notable placement throughout the season, as a throwback to its old Lumberry Swagger strategy with Thunderous. This time, however, it didn't need a Lumberry. With Swagger Tapu Fini as a teammate, Scizor could once more bypass the need to set up Swords Dance. Hey, at least it benefits a tiny bit from the Tapus. This strategy strategy was used by Matt Carter to place 6th at the Birmingham Regionals by intelligently managing terrain with his Tapu Fini. But honestly, the amount of investment put in just to get a Mon that still couldn't do anything to Arcanine or Celesteela just wasn't worth it, and Scizor fell into irrelevance for most of 2017. However, for what seems like the first time in ages, Scizor actually managed to raise its usage in 2018. While it did get Bug Bite back, it was also due to the newly boosted power of Rain Teams in 2018, which is of course a huge boon for Scizor. While Rain had its place in 2017 in the form of the Ducks team featuring Golduck and Pelipper, 2018 reintroduced Politoed as a significantly more powerful Rain setter, allowing Scizor to flex its offensive muscle once again. Of course, 2018 also gave Incineroar the full toolkit that turned it into the beast it is today, and Incineroar absolutely demolishes Scizor. As such, running Scizor outside of Rain was tantamount to throwing the game. Early in the season, Felipe Mendez of Chile won the Chile special event and placed 
second at the Hopper Mech special event with his Mega Swampert and Scizor team. And JS Dale placed sixth at Malaysia's special event with Mega Scizor. Scizor's big breakout, however, came at the Latin American International Championships, while rising star Carson Confer used Source Dance Mega Scizor with Eject Button Politoed, Sash Bisharp, Life Orb Tapu Koko, Water EMZ Ludicolo, and Assault Vest Special Lander Asterion to win the entire tournament. Carson inspired a few other trainers to use double priority rain teams that would pick off the enemies that lived through Ludicolo's initial assault, including Jinwoo Lee's 17th place and Hyrule Contreras' 7th place Dragonite variant at the Toronto Regionals. Carson also used the same team in his campaign at Madison Regionals later in the year, where he placed 6. Malcolm McKellar used a version with Surge Surfer Alolan Raichu, Incineroar, and Pelipper to finish 8th at the Melbourne Regionals. Non Rain Scissor had a few appearances as well, with Giovanni Costa using it alongside Mega Gengar and Star Raptor to finish 5th at the Salt Lake City Regionals. While Scizor once again had sparse results at Worlds, Carson championed it to better results than it had seen in years. He replaced his Bisharp with Stack Attacka and placed top 16 at Worlds as the only Scizor player with a top cut performance. 2019's return to the restricted format meant less Scizor usage once again. Although it still had a very small bit of experimental usage as a Xerneas counter, players had a plethora of other options to choose from, such as Dustmane Necrozma, Stack Attacka, Hartana, Lunala, or Naiho Eagle. With Xerneas not quite as dominant and more answers to it, Scizor had no place in a restricted metagame. It might as well have not existed at all, actually. And now, of course, it no longer does exist in VGC. And even if it were to come back, it's hard to imagine it having much success in doubles. As long as Incineroar is around, Scizor will have a hard time ever establishing itself in the metagame. And even without that, there are now better Steel types and actually good Fire types who will keep it out of the meta for the time being. And that's it, so how great was Scizor actually? Well, it took it a while to hit its stride as its limited move pull held it back in the first two generations, but once it received Bullet Punch in Platinum, everything changed. It was suddenly the face of OU, and that repeated itself in the next generation, while its Mega Form was a top tier Pokemon in the two generations after that. Regular Scizor found itself in UU in Gen 7, but it absolutely dominated there. It's had viable stints in Ubers as well. Sometimes in singles, it feels like there's nothing Scizor can't do. And even in VGC, Scizor had been excellent thanks to its well-rounded blend of defensive utility and offensive power, at least in earlier generations. Scizor has been one of the best OU Pokemon for most of its career, and as such, we can say it is truly great. And despite losing its Mega, it will likely return to some form of greatness in Generation 8, as it's one of the coolest Pokemon ever. Thanks for watching, everyone. And as always, if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Wipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know what do you think about competitive scissor how would you change it to make it more vgc viable also thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos and of course thank you to everyone else watching as well and follow my crew on these social media platforms and that's all i got see you next time everyone